All right. What, what is the task of the church? What resources have been given to the church for the fulfillment of that task? Paragraph 3 says, under this Catholic visible church, Christ hath given the ministry and oracles of uh, ministry oracles and ordinances of God. Ordinances is usually a word that, that encompasses both the sacraments and prayer and the ministry of the word. So you have the word sacraments and prayer, the three of those together. Typically that's what's meant by ordinances. Oracles would be the scriptures for the for here's the tasks gathering and perfecting. So you have the the evangelistic um, mission of the church, and then uh, you could call that the educational or witness and worship, um, evangelism and teaching. So you gather the saints and then you perfect the saints. So it's a it's a very uh, it's a very simple job description which I think is important to keep in mind <coughs> because of the dangers of mission, mission creep. Churches are getting into all different kinds of things, and when in reality we're given a very simple, a very simple mission. I like to think in terms of uh, 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 worship and witness. We conduct public worship service in which the ministry of the word is the central feature. The word is read, preached, sung, prayed, and displayed the sacraments. And... Uh, and then um, we witness. We witness to the world. Evangelism, missions. So we have a large missions budget, and we have targeted ministries, you know, throughout the, that we're engaged in throughout the community. Simple job description. And uh, I think this is a great little phrase here: the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life. That's why we have been given the ministry and the oracles and the ordinances of God. In this life to the end of the world, and doth by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. If we go to the directory for church government, you have this, you have uh, this further developed. And I just I think this is in your notes. I just want to highlight it from the directory for church government. It's. Um, clear that the head of the church is Jesus Christ, not the Pope. And here, not the elders or not the minister. The task, gathering and perfecting the saints, the saints is repeated in the directory for church government. Uh, the, its gifts, uh, the ministry oracles and ordinances of the New Testament, its officers, pastors, teachers, elders, deacons, ordinances, prayer, thanksgiving, singing of psalms, reading of the word, preaching and catechizing, administering the sacraments, blessing the people in the name of God, collection for the poor, it's discipline, congregational eldership consisting of the minister or ministers and other ruling officers of that congregation have power as they shall see just to admonish and rebuke, to suspend from the Lord's table, and finally by way of excommunication. Uh, it's higher courts, local presbyteries, as well as provincial, national, and ecumenical synods are envisioned. Uh, it's ordination. It's theology and process by the imposition of hands and with fasting and prayer. So this, remember, with the directories, that's behind the scenes in the chapter uh, that we, uh, that we, that the chapter on the, on the church has as its background the, the directory for church government. So by way of summary, tasks, worship, and witness, resources, ministry, oracles, and ordinances i.e. a limited job description. Um, Christians as private citizens versus church as an institution. These private citizens are meant to belong to the church as an institution, <laughs> as a visible entity with officers and a government and a form of discipline and in which the ministry is functioning. Okay, what are the marks of the true church? Paragraphs uh, four and five. Uh, this Catholic church has been sometimes more, sometimes less visible. And particular churches which are members thereof are more or less pure 
according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administered in public worship perform more or less purely. In other words, the more that the church is true to its commission, the more visible it is. Its visibility is tied into, so it can be so marred as to be, as to, as to disappear as a church. It can be so marred by heresy and, and, and unwarranted practices as to, no, to unchurch itself, to no longer be a church but be a synagogue of Satan. So the more it is faithful, it, it, the more it is visible in the world. Um, paragraph five, the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. So we've looked at that already in detail and some have degenerated so as to become no church of Christ and <coughs> God of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall, all, there shall be always a church on earth to worship God according to his will. So if you go to the notes to answer this question, the marks of the true church, uh, typically they are both in our confessional and um, sister confessional documents, that they are where the gospel is preached, sacraments rightly administered, and discipline exercised. Okay, who is the sole head of the church and what is the significance of this? Paragraph six. Uh, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof. Now, that used to go on to say that the Pope was the Antichrist. The American edition in 1787 edited that out. But it, that was, um, I mean, uh, the Reformation era, they did, and, and uh, 100 years after, right into the 18th century, nobody flinched at that whatsoever. So why would you think the Church of Rome was Antichrist? Well, because Protestants were getting burned at, you know, at the stake all over Europe, that's why. And they, you know, they're burning incense and offering their prayers in Latin and chanting and so forth while good, godly, faithful Protestant ministers are being burned. Ridley. Latimer, Cranmer, Radford, Hooper, all these uh, Anglican bishops, all burned at the stake. Uh, while the, you know, the, the monks, the hooded, hooded monks uh, are, are carrying their symbols and their Madonnas and all the rest and chanting all this uh, mumbo jumbo in Latin. And, yeah, I mean, just this is, this is uh, the suppression of the true gospel. Yes, this is, this is not maybe the Antichrist, but it's a manifestation of Antichrist. It's crushing the gospel message. So it got edited out in the, 18th, the late 18th century, the, 18, the 18, 1787 edition of the Westminster Confession. But you can understand why, when, because of the severity of the persecution in Catholic lands, And, and when I was in England, that they likened the attitude toward the Roman Catholic Church to American attitudes toward communism from 1950 to 1990. In other words, it's this looming, threatening foreign power. You know, the, you had the, in 1588, you had the Spanish Armada that was attacking in, and, and doing so in order to you know, conquer England for the Pope. So it's this, it's this foreign, it's this, um, um, it's this uh, religion of superstition, um, as Protestants would see it. It's a persecuting religion. It is fighting against uh, the gospel as it is presented in Scripture. It is suppressing that. So anyway, but anyway, it's taken out. But so anyway, the point is the Pope is not the head of the church. Nor any other man. like the king of England. 
Yeah, well, that's an interesting point because um, most of the people who wrote this would have welcomed the monarch back. But, but as the head of the church, I don't. I think I, I believe you're right that they would not have welcomed him back as the head of the church. Uh, no. No. In fact, we're going to get to the, the section on the Erastian controversy. Um, yeah, they definitely would not have welcomed him back as the head of the church, I would say. All right, question number six. Describe the three main forms of church government. Which is, which is the most biblical d discussed government that is both representative and connectional? So you have, um, uh, you have three basic choices when it comes to form of government. It can either be um, a monarchy, like the Episcopal churches, those churches that have bishops, uh, the Roman Catholic, the Methodists, the Lutherans. It's basically a monarchical system in that power is in the hands of the bishop. They don't like to admit it, but congregations have no actual power. They cannot fire the preacher. Only the bishop can fire the preacher. As Christ Church learned um, a couple of decades ago when they tried to fire Mark Roberts. They tried, but they failed because the bishop said, no, Mark wants to stay and I want him to stay. And so he's staying. Uh, and that was that. Uh, the other form is democratic. Most, uh, many, not most maybe, but many congregational and traditionally American Baptist churches have been democratic. Baptist church I grew up in, we had a monthly business meeting. Everything was voted on by the whole <laughs> congregation. That is, everybody that showed up at the business meeting. So everything was, it's pure democracy. Everything is subject to a congregational vote. So it can be a monarchy, it can be a democracy, or it can be a republic. <coughs> uh, and that's what the Presbyterian and Reformed Baptist churches are, that is, a uh, republic is where you elect representatives who then have the power to act and to govern. Um, so you elected a legislature and they enacted Obamacare. You had no vote in that, did you? You had you you did. There was no referendum on Obamacare. The legislature did that, and you elect them to do that. You don't like what they do. You don't have any direct way of controlling it except to throw the bums out at the next election and get the people in there who are going to do what you want to do. Uh, so where the places where we go, Acts 14.23, the Apostle Paul's appointing uh, elders in all the churches. Uh, Titus 1, 4, and 5, he tells Titus to uh, appoint elders who he, in the same passage, calls bishops. So that there was one office. Bishop is the uh, elder, is the office as presbyteros, who episcopoi, who shepherd. Bishops are shepherds, and uh, in, 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 in Titus, both titles are there, uh, connecting the, pres the, pr the presbyters or elders with the bishops, seeing it as a, sing as a singular office in the early church. So I was convinced the Presbyterian government, when I was a student at an Anglican theological college, but the New Testament lecturer, Jervis Angel, was just teaching New Testament, and you know, we just had to say, frankly, uh, the new, in the New Testament, it's a, it's, a, it's a government by elders, not individual bishops exercising power. It's a plurality of elders who are left in charge of the church. So when the apostles die off, who's left? Who's in control? Elders at churches. Um, J.B. Lightfoot, a long essay at the end of his commentary on Philippians. It was writ written back in the 1860s. It's the definitive treatment of the, of the issue. It's called the Christian ministry. Lightfoot was an Anglican, New Testament scholar. He draws the same conclusion. It's clear from Scripture that the biblical the, the form of government, the government of the early church was a representative form of government. It was ruled by elders. People choose their officers. The officers then exercise authority. And then you have this, the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 through 16.4, which, which indicates a connectional form of government. In other words, the congregations are not just autonomous, just a law unto themselves. So there's a dispute in the early church. And so what do they do? They gather in Jerusalem, the, the apostles and elders, you know, as though they are preparing for the transition when there are no more apostles. 
And then they make a decision, Acts 16.4 says they then communicated that to the decrees of the council were communicated to the, to the churches as binding on the churches. So we see, we see a, both a representative form of government and a connectional form of government. In other words, your ministers see no rationale for an independent Presbyterian church. We are one. We agree to serve one. Uh, we agree not to mutiny uh, in our position. But if you want to know our convictions, our convictions are connectional. That's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what is indicated. So in traditional Presbyterianism, it looks like this. You have local church sessions. And then they form regional presbyteries that meet quarterly. And then you have a national general assembly that meets once a year. And so uh, you can petition at this level and get it at the local level and get it approved at the presbytery level and then take it to the general assembly and approve and become policy or principle for the whole denomination or a case of discipline. <laughs> you, can, you can exercise discipline and does the person thinks that you misjudge the case so they can appeal up. It's just like the civil courts for that matter. You appeal up to the presbytery. And if you lose there, you can appeal up to the general assembly. And then if the general assembly resides, uh, resides with you, it then reverses the, the decisions all the way back down to the local level. So an independent Presbyterian is cutting off this process right at the root. There's no appeal up, so if you're an independent Presbyterian Church, what do you do? If you don't like the decision of the session, you appeal down to the congregation. You ask for a congregational meeting. If you can get 25 names, you've got one. Okay, yeah. What, I'm curious if this is not something that you want to speak on, that's okay, of like, what is the current appetite, so to speak, of like, of the officers of the church to welcome, like no longer becoming a, being independent, like is, is that something that has like has been mulled in the past? That it, but there's like one big glaring reason why not to. Uh, there is no one glaring reason. It's just history and tradition. It's never discussed. <laughs> Ever heard it discussed amongst the ministers? <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, um, amongst the, the ministers, we talk about it, um, uh, and, and, and it comes up amongst us because we, especially Tim Shaw, feels this way. If I hope he doesn't mind me citing him, uh, that I don't think he would based on that. That 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 we forfeit a lot in the way of influence. That we are a large, old, his historic Presbyterian church, and if we were part of the part of the denomination, we would have considerably more influence than we do. Be we go to general assembly, we represent no one. If we were representing a church with 850 members um, and bringing with us proportionately elders, that might be 10 elders. I mean, you know, that's some weight. We have some weight, and we forfeit that. We're just over here in Savannah, off the beaten path. You know, we're not even a major, you know, airport hub. And who comes through Savannah? But you know, tourists. And I don't, I don't know. Do you see the the point? Is influence is being forfeited, and we have we, we have a positive in, uh, message that that to send, to bring with us. Okay. Yes. Um. Got it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, if I can kind of answer your question, that like, from what I recall of standing up there, you actually do ask us that question uh, if we would you know, find it acceptable to stay independent and affirm that. I think that what language I use is are you comfortable working within uh, the system of an independent president? So that's, uh, you know, if you are mutinous, divisive, I think that the majority would be in favor of joining the PCA. But I think there would be a vocal and adamant minority who would not want to. And 
it would it would would not be worth the trouble. It would uh, it would cause more division and strife than it's worth. The the cure would ki might might kill the patient. Yeah. Do you see any advantage to being independent, whether to the broader MCA denomination or just internally? I do, in that if this church were not independent, it would be PCUSA right now, and it would be a very liberal place. Because it was independent, it, it stood largely outside of the deterioration of the Southern Presbyterian Church. And I think if they had, like uh, the first, first Scots in Charleston was an independent church until the 1950s. And um, it, you know, it, it got caught up in the, the momentum and the tides of liberalism in the old PCUS. And I think that we largely avoided that and then had the option to call PCA ministers, who happened to be me. OK, communion of the saints. What? Number seven. Hey, Terry. Yeah. Um, Remember. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, so I had the pleasure of uh, worshiping at an OPC church up in Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting family. And uh, speaking to the minister there, he did not have positive things to say about the PCA <coughs> in Mass, in the east, sort of the east coast near Boston. Not the PCA generally, but the that particular Presbytery, is that, does that have the, sort of building on David's question, but does that have the, does it cut both ways if we were to be a part of that? Is there oh, problems there that we don't want to be part of? O-P-C, only pure church. <laughs> uh, there is not a bona fide liberal in the entire PCA. So there is not, no, if you, if you were to deny inerrancy, if you were to deny the five points of Calvinism, you would be out. They would draw and quarter you. Um, so there isn't a legitimate liberal. Are there some progressive vulnerabilities that the trajectory of which is, is, is concerning? Yes. So I just, um, I can't digress this much, but anyway, I was just at uh, this conference, talking about modernism and worship, that, that one of the tragedies of the 20th century is that in, in the 1920s, the Northern Presbyterian Church, the PCUSA, was overwhelmingly conservative and evangelical. There was a liberal document called the Auburn Affirmation. 12% of the ministers signed it. 88% were not signers of the Auburn Affirmation. But it was um, uh, soft-hearted and mushy-headed evangelicals who, in fact, affirmed the confession and confer, affirmed in errancy. And um, but in, name, in the name of the mission and outreach and evangelism and unity of the church and the need, need for united witness, sold, uh, sold out the denomination and Princeton Seminary. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, to me, I just weep and gnash my teeth. When I read Bradley Longfield's uh, Presbyterian Controversy, it's just a man named Charles Erdman. In the PCA, they're in OPC. We, talk about don't be a Charles Erdman, where you believe it all, but you're willing to let the liberals in because you're a nice guy. You know, nobody wants to be a meanie and keep them out. No, let's, you know, we're broad enough to take them in. And once they got in control, then they kept their, all the conservatives. Out. That's what happens every time. So at the time I was in seminary, I wanted to join the Northern Church. I was willing to work within it, even though it had liberalism. I wanted, I saw, saw myself as a, you know, an agent of reform in the Northern Church. Well, they passed the uh, Overture L in the 1970s, which banned anyone who could not, in conscience, affirm the ordination of women. Okay, that was a matter of, of Christian liberty for decades. But then it became mandatory. No freedom of conscience on that. Um, and I was willing to work within the system, but I couldn't, in good conscience, affirm that it was a, a legitimate and valid thing to be doing. Well, you can't, you can't affirm that. You're out. Because you are you represent an ideology that is not a safe place for somebody who is female and ordained or believe. Anyway, that's, that's the same thing that happened in the Episcopal Church and it's now happening in the Methodist Church. Yeah, it's just conservatives <coughs> are out. Oh, it's just awful. You know, I just I, you go to a place like Princeton, and in I don't know how many of these names you, you would be familiar with, but in then the faculty in 1928-29 included J. Gresham Machen. Gerhardus Voss, Cornelius Van Til, John Murray, um, 
Robert Dick Wilson, O.T. Alice. I mean, the, the, that, that's, the, that's a better faculty than any seminary has right now, anywhere in the world. Just, you know, first rate, world class, conservative, orthodox theologian. They reorganized the seminary in 1929, and it starts a downward slide <coughs> that is what Princeton is today, which is, you know, a center of skepticism and unbelief. Warren? Real quickly, it's a really good resource if you want to listen to that history based on the 100th anniversary of Machen's book, which is being <coughs> republished this year. It's published by Westminster Billy, and it's a podcast called Christian Liberals, and they have about a dozen episodes out. There being all sorts of players. That it's very entertaining uh, recounting of all that. Yes, and uh, the Dead Theologian Society at this church is going to read that book. Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. If you get the subtlety of the title. There's Christianity and then there's Liberalism. Liberalism is not Christianity. All right, communion of the saints. All the saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, suffering, death, resurrection, and glory, and being united to one another in love, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the, to the performance of such duties, public and private, as to conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. I mean, this just reinforces everything that we were just saying earlier about the church. You know, you, you know we've all have these gifts and graces and we're obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, that are conducive of the mutual good. In other words, we're all united to Christ, and in united to Christ, we're united to each other. We are brethren. We are mutually dependent. We have, you know, some of us are feet, some of us are hands, some of us are eyes, some of us are ears. We all constitute this body. You can't do without one part, without the whole suffering. You, you know, you lop off the tip of a finger, and it hurts, right? It may not have the same relevance as an eye, but you chop off a finger, and the whole body suffers. That's the point. So the communion, uh, the communion of the saints is, is um, what we're talking about here is, is, is koinonia, it's fellowship. Um, the, uh, the ter the, the, let me go over through this with us. Uh, the terminology, it's, uh, it's the Greek word koinonia. We, we translate it typically fellowship today. Just talking about the, fel the communion of the saints is the fellowship of the saints the relationship believers have with each other in the church. The basis of it is union with Christ, section we just read. Uh, mutual responsibilities, that's, uh, uh, we go on and read in section two, the saints by profession are bound to maintain a, a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in the performing such other spiritual services as tend to their mutual edification. So this is all about 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4.11 to the end of the chapter, um, and also in uh, relieving each other in outward things according to their several abilities and necessities, which communion as God author of opportunity is to be extended unto all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, so so uh, they... they the idea is that we are mutually dependent, uh, mutually responsible. Uh, we have gifts upon which the others depend. And if we fail to exercise the, those gifts, we, we harm the body. We harm the church. We, we impair its ministry. Uh, we cri cripple its mission. When um, folks today talk about uh, looking for community isn't this idea it is this, this is what it is and we got a lot of young guys in here that, and that is great let me just tell you this that i think is just fascinating about the up and coming generation so i've been here thir nearly 37 years now seems like i honestly it seems like i got here yesterday it really does. Uh, but i didn't get here yesterday i got here 30, just about 37 years ago uh, for 30 years, not one person joined the church saying they were joining the church to go to community. Not one. Yep, we never heard the word. The last seven years, virtually every other younger person who joins the church says, hey, you know, I, I just really like the community. I, you know, I'm not sure what all to make of that. 
um, but it sounds like uh, the the, um, the 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 you know internet generation, the media driven generation, the internet generation, um, the social media generation, <clears throat> is starving for friendships, fellowship, community, and they come they they come and they go to the Thursday night Bible study and they hang around Sunday night for the meal and they're you know they're making connections and they're making friendships and and uh, so. Um, we, we, we for, for years and years and years, had people join and not know one person in this church. And I've said that in, you know, dozens of times. They joined, they didn't know one person here, and then over time, you, you know, you come and you ask them, you know, Frankie, who are your best friends in the whole world? And the first five that he'll mention are members here. He didn't know a person when he joined. Best, best friends are five members of the church. So that, that developed, and you would call it fellowship, but I'm telling you, the younger people coming here, it's all about community. And they're getting it Thursday night, often, and that's kind of the road into the life of the church. And then they start, come, you know, they come Sunday morning, then they're back Sunday night, and they hang around with the meal, and they're ready to join. And what are they, what are they drawn to? My great preaching, right? They just love <laughs> the preacher. It's the, it's the preaching. That's what, well, in my generation, that's what it was. I mean, we went to John MacArthur's church out in Panorama City. We never exchanged one word with John MacArthur. I never so much as shook his hand. And I went there for three, the better part of three years. We didn't care about meeting him. We just wanted to sit there and hear that preaching. And then we'd go and we'd fight about it and argue about it and discuss it. And absolutely, we were... we were. That, that was the community that we were enjoying. Then was the it was. was the afterwards. Yeah. I, I was a very weak Sabbatarian at the time. We'd go to In-N-Out Burgers and we'd sit around eating our double dub and, and having a, a milkshake and talking about... Johnny Mac and the message and what he said. It was great. In and out is food of the gods. That has to be. Yeah, it's just it's so good. So good. Uh, so, yes, that's what this chapter is about. It's about the communion of the saints, the fellowship of the people of God, the vital role. So, a person cannot say, as the Apostle Paul quotes people as saying in 1 Corinthians 12, that, um, you know, I'm just this minor player. Uh, I have no need of the body. The body has no need of me. No, even if you're just a fingernail. You know, if somebody takes some tweezers and pulls the finger, that's how they torture people, pulls those fingernails out, you're going to find out how much you do need those fingernails. So that really is, is the point of, of this, this uh, chapter. And then clarification in paragraph 3, this communion which the saints have with Christ does not make them in any wise partakers of the substance of his Godhead. So our union with Christ does not divinize us, where the Greek Orthodox Church comes very close to saying that, if indeed it doesn't say that. So we do not participate in the substance of God. Uh, or to be equal with Christ in any respect, either of which to affirm is impious and blasphemous, right? Nor doth their communion one with another as saints, take away or infringe the title or propriety with it each man has in his goods and possessions. Uh, so we're brothers, so I'm going to come by and, um, you know, I'm going to borrow your car for a month. I mean, we're brothers, right? We're brothers. Mine is yours, but yours is mine. No, it's denying that uh, this you know, obliterates the right to one's own property and goods. All right. Um, did I finish that uh, question, same question? Why is fellowship among believers important? I think we said enough about that. Moving on to the sacraments. <clears throat> However, I took a unexpected turn with you by first asking questions about the Word of God because while the confession doesn't develop it, the, the catechism, so the larger catechism, 154 to 160, shorter catechism, 88 through 90, has a lot of questions about the ministry of the word. <coughs> the three primary means of grace, larger catechism, 154, shorter catechism, I think it's number 88, are the word, the sacraments, and prayer. So the confession, for reasons I don't quite understand, does not have a section on the word the catechisms, however, do expand on it. What does it mean to listen to the word? How is the word to be preached? And that, so it's, a, you know, four questions. Is it four? Is it five questions in the 
six questions. It's a bunch of questions in the larger catechism about the ministry of the word. Um, so what are the three primary means of grace? So this is a question of how do we get the benefit of what Jesus did long ago and far away? Which is, I, to me, that's, that's an obvious question. We're separated from that cross and the tomb, the empty tomb, by 2,000 years. How do we span that time? We're separated by thousands of miles and a, an entire ocean separates us. So spatially and in terms of time, we are, we are far away from what Jesus did in Palestine 2,000 years ago. How do we get the benefit of that? The answer of the confession and the catechisms is the Holy Spirit takes what Jesus did, working through the word, brings that forward across all that space and all that time to us in the present moment. So the benefits of Christ come to us through spirit and word. And we Reformed Christians, we Presbyterians, are very good about keeping those two things together. Word and spirit, always together. Not spirit without word, which leads to fanaticism. Not word without spirit, which, which leads to kind of a cold intellectualism. It's word and spirit. Through the ministry of the word, the spirit brings the benefits of Christ uh, to us. Well, and through the, as well as through sacraments and prayer. Uh, of what importance is the preached word to the life of the church? So um, I just trust you went and read the larger catechism and the shorter catechism. But what, what they say is uh, it's, it's especially through the preached word that uh, the benefits of Christ come to us. So there are these other means for sure, but it is especially the preaching of the word. So that's in uh, Shorter Catechism 88, Larger Catechism 155. There are three means of grace, but it is especially through the preaching of the word. So a very, very high view of preaching. In fact, the second Helvetic Confession says that when the word is rightly preached, God speaks. Very high view of the, the, minute, the, the, the preaching of the word. That, uh, in fact, not in a neo-orthodox sense, but in a godly and pious sense, uh, Dr. Packer would say that the Bible becomes the word of God when it's preached. It's in, in the sense that it's meant to be preached. Of course, it's the word of God when it just sits there. But it becomes the living word when it is being preached. That the Bible was written to be preached. Most of it was in the form of oral communication, then written down, but it's meant to be taken from the, the written back to the oral and, and proclaimed. Yes? Uh, would Anglicans see the uh, uh, <coughs> communion or Eucharist as, more of, as almost more important or as important as preaching? Of course, they do. The Roman Catholics definitely do. Yeah, I mean, that's why uh, they, they didn't even have preaching in the medieval mass. Preaching was done in the afternoon. They called it a prone, a prone, the prone service. And so there was some great medieval preaching, but it wasn't done in the ordinary worship of the church. It was outside of the service. Was, uh, you come back in the afternoon if you want to hear preaching. And, and, and so uh, the main thing was the sacrament, the receiving of the sacrament. And then you only received it in one kind, only the bread. The cup was denied to the people. Okay, so a very uh, elevated view of the preaching of the word in, in our tradition. <clears throat> and if you want some biblical support for that, go to Ephesians 4.11 and read to the end of the chapter, where God has given the word gift, the evangelists and teachers and preachers for the building up of the whole body of Christ. So that the, you know, the trigger to the congregational health, the, the foundation of that health, to mix my metaphors, is the proclamation of the word. It's the preaching that then empowers and, and, and provides for the growth and health of all the other parts of the body. Okay, um, next question is number 11. What is the sacrament and upon what does their efficacy depend? Uh, a sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. Okay, any questions? All right, next question. 
Um, all right, upon what does their efficacy depend? The confession and catechisms have already indicated that the Spirit works through the Word to bring about effectual call, justifying faith, saving faith, repentance, sanctification, assurance, perseverance, and now the efficacy of the sacraments, and we could just broaden that out to all, all three means of grace. Going back to the section in which we study the, the, the Holy Spirit, Calvin is the theologian of the Holy Spirit because the whole ordo salutis is applied by the Spirit and then the whole ministry, the whole ministry of the church, the ministry of the word, sacraments, and prayer are animated and enlivened and empowered by the Holy Spirit and apart from whom um, they, uh, they are ineffectual. So the efficacy of the, of the sacraments depends upon the spirit. All right, sacraments are holy signs and seals. So this is Romans 4, 11, in which circumcision is called a sign and seal of justification. So it, it's a sign, it signifies. What do signs do? They signify something. And what's a seal? A seal is a confirmation. Think of a seal on a letter. It's confirming uh, the validity or the seal on a document. It, 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 ought, it, it indicates its, uh, its legitimacy, its validity, its legality. So it is a seal is the thing that confirms, that ratifies. So a sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace immediately instituted by God to represent Christ. So that's the sign. It represents Christ and his benefits. And to confirm our interest in him and also to put a visible difference between those that belong under the church and the rest of the world and solemnly to engage them in the service of God and Christ according to his word. There is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the things signified where it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. So there's a very close connection. Baptism, the Lord's Supper are crucial. Peter can say, 2 Peter 3 somewhere, baptism now saves you. That's how close the association with the sacraments and salvation are. That's a, uh, a spiritual relation or sacramental union. Do you have to participate in the Lord's Supper to be saved? No. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No. But, but is it vital? Is it crucial? So crucial that sometimes they are related in that close association that one would think it was necessary for salvation? Yes. That's how important, that's how crucial the sacraments are. So don't complain about the Lord's Supper because it means the service is going to be 15 minutes longer. Because this is, this is vital food for the soul. The grace which is in, exhibited or in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. All right, what is that addressing? Focus, focus. <laughs> no. It's addressing ex opere operato. Yeah, it, it, that, that, you know, ex opere operato, in the working, it works. Yeah, it... it um, uh, that there is an inherent power in the sacrament. So the Jesuits might line up uh, an Indian tribe in Mexico and slash water on them in the name of the Trinity and christen them, Christianize them, because the efficacy is, the power of the efficacy is in the thing itself. We, this is being denied. Uh, what empowers the sacrament uh, and makes it effectual is faith and the operation of the Holy Spirit. It's not inherent in the baptism. You don't automatically receive grace by ingesting the communion wafer, which is, again, the Roman Catholic claim that it has an inherent power. So you don't need to understand anything. You don't need to have any faith. You just ingest the, uh, the bread, and, and it, uh, it, it, it provides grace for, the, for your soul. So this is being denied. Neither doth the efficacy of the sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that doth administer it. Well, you were baptized by this, you know, barely believing liberal minister back in a, 
you know, the Northern Presbyterian Church back in the day, is your baptism valid? The answer is yes. The question is not, was the minister a godly man? The question is, was the church a church? And was it legitimately a, a, a administered? So if the church is a church, the baptism is valid. If a church had unchurched itself, say like Jehovah Witnesses, how about a Jehovah, Jehovah Witness baptism? Is that legitimate? No, of course not. A Mormon baptism? No, they're not a church. Can a church become so apostate that it is a synagogue of Satan and its baptisms are not valid? Yes. So that, that's the issue. So the, it's not dependent upon the character of the minister, but the character of the church. Is it a church? If it's a church, it's valid. So I, I believe Roman Catholic baptisms are valid. I have many, many fellow ministers who believe they are not valid because they want to say Rome is apostate. I don't believe it is. I believe it seriously errs. But it affirms the classical doctrine of God, the classical Christology. Um, it, to give, it believes in the primacy of grace to a point. Um, does it seriously err on justification? Yes, it does. Will I repeat Roman Catholic baptisms? No. I don't think it's a synagogue of Satan. I think it's a legitimate church that seriously errs. All right. Um, um, uh, but upon the work of the Spirit and the word of institution, which contains together with a precept authorizing the use thereof, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. All right, we've got to call it a night. And uh, so next week, we're again, it's two, it's, I was going to say two a day, two weeks, Wednesday and Thursday next week. And uh, at the rate we're going, we may never finish. <laughs>